I just got a phone call. And it was like, it was just so horrific. And I couldn't take it in. He was gone, you know. Yeah, it was very difficult. Paul McCartney is a name that has traveled across generations. From a Liverpool lad to becoming a global icon, the Beatles legend made his mark on the world's entertainment industry and saw an unfathomable success. But his ride in fame has been a roller coaster filled with happiness and tragedy. Despite how wealthy or accomplished he is, the curtain that hides the man behind the music has dropped, and the story of this unparalleled musical giant has been unveiled. What was life like for Paul growing up? How joyful and glamorous is Paul McCartney's life when not under the spotlight? In this video, we will discuss how Paul McCartney is now over 80 and lives a sad life. For James Paul McCartney, born in the busy port town of Liverpool in 1942, life was like an untuned guitar, a mesmerizing symphony waiting to be composed. Welcomed into a working-class family, his upbringing was filled with music and laughter as his father, Jim, frequently filled their home with songs by Glenn Miller and Fats Waller. Jim was a salesman and a soulful jazz pianist, while his mother, Mary, was a compassionate nurse who made him fall in love with poetry and storytelling. What was life like for Paul growing up? In young Paul, the flower of music bloomed early. At the tender age of four, he displayed his superhuman powers on the piano as his fingers played the keys and told stories without words. The spark that Paul always had in his eye while making music caught the attention of his father, who gifted him a second-hand trumpet as an encouragement, and this gesture bloomed Paul's love for melodies. Life in Liverpool was a pattern of togetherness and companionship. Paul indulged in the small delights of life, cricket in the park, football with his friends, becoming part of the chaos of the streets. He learned to play the guitar independently, and the string sound was a soothing balm for his troubled soul. He inhaled music like air, consuming the riffs of Elvis Presley, Little Richard, and Chuck Berry, their rock and roll anthems kindling the flames of his artistic soul. Paul spent his early student life at the Liverpool Institute, a renowned grammar school, to which he was admitted in 1922. He was outspoken in English and art, with the pen-writing poetry and the brush-capturing dreams on canvas. His love for literature overflowed into his songwriting. His lyrical expression had a profoundness that went beyond being mere pop music. However, Paul's musical fate took wings on the stage of the school's yearly talent show. Using a borrowed guitar, he was slung across his shoulder and some tremors in his voice. He amazed the audience with a performance of Long Tall Sally. There was a star in the making, an ember that was soon to become a dynamic explosion of musical revolution known simply as a member of the legendary Beatles. Before we unveil Paul's profound struggles behind the curtains, Let's delve into his roller coaster ride with the Beatles. This iconic band began to take form at a garden party in Liverpool, where 16 year old John Lennon, an aspiring rock and roll fan, met Paul McCartney. John was amazed by Paul's talents and invited him to become a member of his band, the Quarrymen. With time, yet another prodigy, George Harrison, followed with his blistering guitar solos. Life was not all song and dance. Bandmates continued to follow, from Stuart Sutcliffe, who suggested the name Beatles, initially with twos, to Pete Best, the drummer, who wasn't quite the best, according to producer George Martin. Brian Epstein was their manager back in Liverpool, guiding them through disappointments and auditions. Famously, Decca Records said, Guitar groups are on the way out, but in reality, George Martin at EMI spotted their potential and signed them. Next was Ringo Starr, who took the spot of Pete Best on the other set of drums, completing the famous Fab Four we all know and cherish. The band's first chart-topping single, written by Paul even before the band's formation, Love Me Do, reached the heights, quickly followed by Please Please Me, a chart smash. They released their first album, Please Please Me, in one day, 10 songs in one rolling round. Impressive. What followed, 
in March 1963, was a record album that shot to the top of the charts, fueling the fire of Beatlemania. Beatlemania did not simply refer to something that sounded cool. Beatlemania was like a tidal wave of screaming teens and deafening hysteria that trailed the band like water follows the moon. Their second album, With the Beatles, further consolidated their position as it sold a million copies in the UK. On the other side of the Atlantic, the Beatles would continue to develop their myth. However, in December 1963, I Wanna Hold Your Hand broke through the wall, reaching the top of the US charts as the group's first American number one. Perceiving that they had a gold mine, Capitol Records released three Beatles albums almost simultaneously, each constituting a hurriedly stitched quilt of their early hits. February 9, 1964, is subsequently marked in history. The Beatles appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, their first American television appearance, and the United States went into hysteria. About 73 million Americans, or almost half the population, saw the birth of what would become a legend. Beatlemania, has officially gone across the Atlantic. The wave of the British invasion, propagated by the Beatles and bands such as the Rolling Stones, crossed the whole of the United States and hairstyles somehow came to represent a subtle act of rebellion on behalf of the youth. Capitol even took advantage of the hype and issued the Beatles' second album in the United States, though it was their third album release worldwide. As of April, the Beatles simultaneously had 14 songs on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, and their music was everywhere. They also entered into films with A Hard Day's Night, a musical comedy depicting their crazy days in life that became a blockbuster and resulted in their third official album. With the whirlwind tour still strong, the Fab Four spent the summer playing 37 shows in 27 days, winning hearts and stadiums worldwide. In the northern part of the continent, their tour confronted them with the grim reality of racial exclusivity. In Jacksonville, neither was willing to play to a segregated audience and so threatened to cancel unless seating was integrated. Their fourth album, Beatles for Sale, indicated how commercial pressure can lead to a clash between commercial pressure and artistic freedom. It even touched upon cynicism, daring to venture beyond the realms of love songs. However, it reached the top spot in the UK. To cash in on the fad, Capitol Records released Beatles 65, a compilation of most of its re-recordings. 1965 marked a turning point. A shocking LSD adventure with dentist John Riley served as a key to opening new horizons for psychedelic research. Their music evolved into more complex, yet still melodic, compositions. Another Capitol compilation, Beatles the Six, came out in June, even though it was their seventh release drawing on the North American market. Despite contention, Queen Elizabeth bestowed the Order of the British Empire on the band. The second of these films, Help! appeared and its soundtrack, Help, were released as the group's fifth studio album, Ticket to Ride and Yesterday, which would later be christened the most covered song, firmly established their legendary status. The band chose to use something other than the singles compilation formula and go for an album. Rubber Soul was an acclaimed masterwork characterized by depth and sophistication. The use of marijuana is said to have powered their creativity, resulting in folk-infused melodies, new instruments, and brighter tones. They solidified their stance as forever legends with hits like We Can Work It Out and Norwegian Wood. Lennon's infamous Jesus statement in 1966 sparked a wave of protests and death threats, and albums burned up. Further inflaming the fire, Capitol released the infamous Yesterday and Today album cover. However, the shouting audience did not abate. Their deafening cheers challenged live performances, leading them to announce their last tour, Revolver. This seventh album was also a success that explored psychedelia further and challenged the limits of popular music. Eleanor Rigby and Paperback Writer, with their revolutionary music videos, secured these bands 
their leading position in musical innovation. Critics considered it a classic, perhaps the best album of all time. The Beatles played their final paid show on August 29, 1966 at San Francisco's Candlestick Park. Now a studio band, they poured their hearts into their next masterpiece, the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This album was released in 1967 and went beyond the music industry. With one false swoop, its iconic cover, printed lyrics, and earth-shattering concept introduced the progressive rock genre and the counterculture movement in one fell swoop. It redefined pop music forever. In August, a tragedy occurred when Brian Epstein died and the group lost direction. The critics panned the follow-up movie, Magical Mystery Tour, but the soundtrack continued selling. The band turned to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in India to find some repose, practicing transcendental meditation. This period of self-reflection would herald their new creative era. They started Apple Corps in 1968 as a multimedia company for artists, but it eventually became their creative playground. Their ninth album, appropriately entitled The White Album, was a double LP and explosion of styles, mirroring their divisiveness. As they emerged from the chaos, these hits were Obla Di, Obla Da, and While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Their 1969 Yellow Submarine film provided a psychedelic break from reality, but its soundtrack and prior compositions met mediocre reviews. McCartney, however, missing live shows, convinced the band to reunite for rehearsals full of distractions and Yoko's presence. The farewell to their fans came months later, in January 1969, at a final surprise rooftop concert atop Apple headquarters. After August, with the recording of The End, the band ended for all intents and purposes. Lennon was the first to leave the band in September, privately notifying the others. The masses did not know about it until Abbey Road launched in October. This last studio masterpiece displayed Harrison's genius with songs such as Something and Here Comes the Sun. The climactic sound of the Beatles' dissolution was reached on September 20, 1969. John Lennon, driven by personal passions and creative dreams, handed Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr the devastating announcement that he was leaving the music group. Although it might have seemed like an abrupt, disharmonious sound, the fractures had been building or accumulating for quite some time. Always a realist, McCartney saw the oncoming storm. Even though the band was a success, it was just a shadow of its former self. They pulled together a final album, Let It Be, from Rogue Recordings released in 1970 and a revealing documentary tracking their final days. Lennon's confession was followed by a long period of restless silence on the part of the band. Finally, on the 10th of April, 1970, the dam burst. The Beatles' disbandment was publicly revealed in a press release by McCartney with a heavy heart. However, like the phoenix rising from the ashes, McCartney embarked on a solo path. McCartney's first solo album, which was published only seven days after the divorce, was a vivid example of his creative autonomy. It was a raw and personal tribute to a world without the Beatles, illustrating his abilities as a composer, instrumentalist, and producer. The album has since earned its status as one of the cornerstones of his solo career, despite initial criticisms. Ram, his next work, mirrored a similar pattern. At first, people treated it with disbelief, but thanks to the fact that it has turned into one of his favorites. Unperturbed by criticism, McCartney kept breaking boundaries, challenging with his band Wings' new sonic landscapes. But Wildlife their first album together, didn't sell that well. At the time, Rolling Stone considered it lackluster, a view that has persisted over time. The band's demise gave birth to a stormy period for their relationship. Flying angry letters, the musical field took the form of a battlefield for their resentments. The harmony they once shared in their collaborations was replaced by bitterness, and in songs like McCartney's Too Many People and Lennon's Venomous How Do You Sleep, 
with its stinging lines like, The only thing you did was yesterday. This bitterness was reflected in some of the songs. Despite all the bitterness, time turned out to be a mild healer, the duo reuniting in the last years of Lennon's life. But their discussions moved from the intricacies of composition to small pleasures, such as family or baking bread. Lennon's final words, as relayed by Linda McCartney, were, Remember me from time to time, old friend. Although the Paul and Lennon bond had some bumps along the way, the relationship with George Harrison was far more troubled. An example of their tension was Harrison's involvement in Lennon's How Do You Sleep, where he played guitar, despite the tune's blatant victim. But an unusual turn of events occurred in 1974. Lennon and McCartney also resumed communicating and even improvised together. There were even rumors of a potential reunion of the Beatles, which was quickly classified as Idol by Harrison, who, while recognizing McCartney's talents as a musician, preferred to work with Lennon. Harrison was frequently in the Beatles overshadowed by the dominant Lennon and McCartney tandem. Tension intensified in 1969, to the point where Lennon even suggested replacing Harrison at the studio. For decades to follow, such discord between Harrison and McCartney lingered until the mid-1990s, when they reunited for a short performance. With the Beatles' Sun Again setting, the rise of another powerful musical force captivated hearts with a passion that matched theirs. The late 1960s witnessed the emergence of the Jackson Five, a musical family featuring prodigious children on the stage and Michael Jackson, who carved out his youth into the global powerhouse he was. It was interesting to see Jackson collaborate with Paul McCartney in the 1980s to create music that looked promising, but, in the end, failed. The roots of this collaboration were laid down with McCartney's composition Girlfriend, which was first recorded for Jackson and ended up on Wings' London Town album. Later, Jackson recorded the track for his own Off the Wall album. This partnership produced a series of legendary songs, such as The Girl Is Mine on the Thriller album by Jackson and The Man and Say Say on the Pipes of Peace album by McCartney. But amid the harmonious tunes, a discordant tone cropped up. On the subject of music publishing, McCartney, who had purchased the rights to Buddy Holly's catalog, said the value of owning such to Jackson in a discussion. What he did not know, however, was that this suggestion would result in a change that would permanently destroy their relationship. In 1985, Jackson made a seismic acquisition. They bought the Beatles' catalog, the greatest prize in pop music. This business move cast a large shadow over their relationship, which used to be cordial. Disappointed, McCartney said, I think it's one thing to do something like that to someone's friend, but to then take the rug from under them. It only became worse when Jackson licensed Beatles songs for commercial purposes, on top of angering McCartney even more. Unfortunately, this disagreement became the defining chapter of their musical relationship. The tragedy that struck in 1980 with Lennon's assassination and Harrison's defeat of lung cancer in 2001 has left McCartney and Starr as the only Beatles members alive, and they are still working on Lennon's unreleased songs. How has Paul McCartney's life been away from the spotlight? 1956. A year forever branded into McCartney's mind with a scarlet ink of loss as fate dealt a cruel blow when his mother died of breast cancer, leaving a big hole in his life. This tragedy, so raw and abrasive, inspired one of the Beatles' most classic and poignant songs, Let It Be, based on lyrics infused with a melancholic beauty that still seem to echo the echoes of his pain each note as a testament to the mother McCartney deeply loved and left. However, McCartney, not overwhelmed by despair, rejected the feelings of grievance. During an open interview with Stephen Colbert, he described how he had not realized that the loss of his mother was a direct reflection of his music. Instead, he characterized it as a slow burn, a deficit stemming from his body and slowly seeping into his creative work. This belated acknowledgement tells much of the sheer weight caused by his mother's death, 
a sore that was still sensitive even after years had passed. Everything changed when Stuart Sutcliffe, the original bassist of the Beatles, strolled away to pursue other artistic ambitions. Only in 1960 did the search for a permanent substitute begin. Chaz Newby had held the bass briefly, but his fleeting commitment kept the hole unfilled. In a world where luck sometimes matches opportunities needed to shine, Paul had the biggest choice to make. And what did he choose? The lack of a specific bass player left the Beatles in an uncomfortable position. Paul McCartney, the band's main guitarist, became a victim of decision-making. He mentioned, oh no. So we're like, we don't even have a bass player. Everyone kind of looked at me. I was a little saddled with it. It was more like, oh well, if it's not you, who then? John would never have done it. Even though he had been initially hesitant to accept the challenge, McCartney accepted it. He wasn't averse to adaptation. Once his guitar was kaput, he changed musical instruments to the piano without any difficulty, thus demonstrating his exceptional musical multitasking. His adaptability didn't go a nota set. Rolling Stone ranked him number nine on their list of the 50 greatest bass players of all time. This unforeseen twist not only defined McCartney's musical path, but also subtly changed the balance of the band. Throughout the early phases of the band, Lennon was the dominant leader, but toward the mid-1960s, there was a silent change as McCartney gradually took over. Certainly, McCartney's rule propelled the Beatles into a golden age, which also carried the seeds of their destruction. The 1964 Lennon-McCartney songwriting split matched this change in power. McCartney took Can't Buy Me Love as the A-side, igniting fierce competition from Lennon. The ensuing years would, however, be punctuated by a musical seesaw whereby each song acted as a sonic rebuttal to the others. Lennon answered McCartney's Yesterday with Norwegian Wood and Strawberry Fields Forever received its mate in Penny Lane. McCartney stated that this period of creative rivalry, born from an unpredictable change of instruments and leadership, was both a blessing and a curse. He also acknowledged this competition as fuel for their creative fire. McCartney acknowledged this competition as fuel for their creative fire. It was a great way for us to keep each other on our toes. Though it produced some of the Beatles' best-known music, it also sowed the seeds of strife that ultimately resulted in their turbulent breakup. Though successes followed Paul McCartney's takeover, the darkness also overshadowed the previously harmonious collaboration with the group. According to what Ian Diamond is referring to in his book, Revolution in the Head, John Lennon's nose felt increasingly itchy as McCartney took creative control. McCartney was writing songs and arranging, producing, and, in a sense, acting as the band's musical conductor. As people know, a rumor can make or mar influential people. Likewise, the same thing happened in Paul's case. What was the rumor? An odd and recurring rumor developed in 1966 about the demise and replacement of Paul McCartney. However, while recording Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, rumors circulated that McCartney died in a car accident. According to the legend, to preserve the band's image, he was replaced with a doppelganger. Rolling Stone took the rumor back to a mysterious caller who supposed that the hidden messages, such as Turn Me On Dead Man, could be heard in backward Beatles songs. While McCartney was very much alive, only the myth took on a life of its own. Alleged clues were revealed in album covers, lyrics, and even music videos. McCartney was the deceased sensation, for the Abbey Road cover became a symbolic funeral procession. Life magazine tried to restrain the gossip by dispatching reporters who interviewed McCartney at his Scottish farm. His offbeat answer only added oil to the flames. Not so long after their manager Brian Epstein died in 1967, and this sudden blow only worsened the fissures. But without his advisory influence, the Beatles were torn apart by internal conflicts that darkened the hinterland of their veins. Their happy partnership was showing cracks, which signaled a rather stormy finale. Not forgetting that Paul had a life away from the band, his love affair with his late wife, Linda Eastman, was a love story in every sense. 
By 1967, Linda had become part of the Beatles' world of euphoria, Joplin, capturing captivating photos of the band. By that time, they got acquainted through her working with Bob Dylan and Janis Joplin, her daughter, whereas in 1969, they married each other. They created a stunning family between them and welcomed Mary, Stella, and James with them while raising Linda's daughter, Heather. They started playing music together during the 1970s, creating the band Wings. While their musical endeavors remained prominent, family came first for both of them, as Linda skillfully juggled her life as a musician while being a mother and an activist, primarily aiming at animal rights and vegetarianism. It was a tragedy in 1995 when Linda was diagnosed with breast cancer, the same disease from which Paul's mother died. Although they tackled this challenge on a unified front, Linda fell to the disease in 1998. However, in the same year, Paul McCartney told the BBC about the devastation of losing his wife, Linda, to breast cancer. He highlighted the ignorance about the disease that was typical of the time, juxtaposing the accepted stoicism with his bold acceptance of mourning. He confessed a year of tears and agony, the naked hurt reverberating in his speech. In search of peace in a new book, McCartney married model and media personality Heather Mills in 2002. Only six years later, the marriage crashed with jabs and counter-jabs all over the British tabloids, with mud thrown at both poles. Mills was accused of abuse, and McCartney was accused of irresponsibility and disrespect. Surprisingly, Mills contended that McCartney mistreated Linda, a notion strongly disputed by Stella. In 2008 divorce hearings, the judge, frustrated with Mills' inconsistencies, gave her a much lower settlement than she had requested. In contrast, while the media had been frenzying and Mills was using self-defense to highlight her charity work, the chapter ended with her being seen in a negative light. One good turn deserved another. Going forward, McCartney settled down in his 2011 marriage with Nancy Shevel. However, beyond the headlines lies another unknown aspect of McCartney's life. His history with drugs. Drugs featuring Preluden during Hamburg's early days and Dylan's introduction of marijuana were a part of his life. Amidst all this, cannabis, in particular, served as a springboard for his creativity, driving such songs as Another Kind of Mind, while even the LSD voyages he talked about out loud helped to spur his changing worldview. However, supporting the legalization of cannabis had some legal implications. Arrests in Japan. Thanks for watching. Before leaving this video, Make sure to like it and watch another one of our interesting videos. See you on the far side.